We will, we will now, it's not working. There we go. I was talking to myself there for a second. Um, we will now reconvene to open session for council meeting Tuesday, September 3rd, 2019. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Council Member Mosby. Present. Council Member Vega. Here. Council Member Cordova. Present. Count, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dirk Starbuck. Present. Mayor Janelle Osborne. Here. Council Member Cordova. I know that you have something to share with the public regarding attendance. Yes, so I will unfortunately be stepping away from tonight's meeting before we hit um, public hearing item number three on the agenda. I have a flight that I need to catch for work and it's a red eye and I have to drive all the way to LAX. So I do apologize, I won't be here for that agenda item. Thank you for that. All right, any report on action taken during closed session? Yes, thank you, Mayor. The City Council met in closed session to discuss the four items on the agenda. Uh, on all four of those items, staff gave reports and the council had a discussion, but no reportable action was taken. Thank you. Now, if you will please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, there are no presentations this evening, but presentations have been made in the prior weeks. On August 21st, I presented certificates of recognition to Frank Young and Kathleen McCullough at the annual Veterans Breakfast hosted by Congressman Salud Carbajal at the Vets Building. And on August 21st, I presented certificates of recommendation of recognition to the Tina Mercer of Volunteer of the Year, Southside Coffee for Small Business Excellence Award, and proclamations for Man of the Year to Donald Ramirez and Woman of the Year to Lucy Tom Harrington at the Lompoc Chamber of Commerce and Visitors Bureau Annual Award Dinner, and congratulations to all of those individuals. City Manager Report, please. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Oh, uh, just a few tonight. The Lompoc Museum and Rancho Prisma chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution are happy to announce that the three-year project to repair and enhance the 1924 World War I monument on the grounds of the Lompoc Museum has been completed. They are planning a brief ceremony and unveiling of the completed monument with its majestic bronze eagle at 11 a.m. on Saturday, September 7th. There will be a brief ceremony, some light refreshments, and a tour of the special exhibit, Lompoc Goes to War. We also have uh, staff submitted a response to the Santa Barbara Planning and Development Department on the 26th of August in response to their comments and, re and concerns regarding our pending LAFCO application for the Bailey Corridor annexation, where we also requested a second meeting by October, which is the requirement to deem our application with LAFCO complete. LAFCO being the Local Area Formation Commission, which has approval on whether cities can expand or not, their boundaries. Um, the Aquatic Center reopened following closure for maintenance and upgrades. We'd like to recommend or like to commend recreation staff and our many part-time youth recreation leaders, lifeguards, pool clerks who worked as a team to assist with deep cleaning of the facility. It looks great and if you haven't gotten there yet, please go have a look. And also with um, our first new housing now being built in quite some time, the Prisma Hills development, also known as Summit View Homes, has submitted to the building division to pull permits for its first two models. That was it. Councilmember Mosby. Is that LAFCO letter available somewhere? Um, I can get it. I know it's, we sent it down, but I can get, I can get a it copy. It can be attached on this council meeting? That's an attachment? Oh, we can. Oh, it was, it was CC'd to the council, but we can attach No, it. we got a copy. I just wanted for the public. Oh. Okay, no, I, I did not do that for that, but I can have it. Okay, attached. thank you. Any other questions for the city manager? Seeing none, thank you for that. Public comment for consent calendar item is next. Consent calendar is a list of items considered to be routine and will be enacted after one motion in the form listed below. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless good cause is shown prior to the council vote. Any items withdrawn 
from the consent calendar for separate discussion will be addressed immediately before the second oral communication near the end of the meeting. Is there anyone here to speak on a consent calendar item? Seeing no one rise, we will close consent calendar public comment and return it to council discussion. Council Member Starbuck. I'll move we go ahead and accept the consent calendar. Council I'll Member second. And Council Member Vegas seconds that. Any other discussions? Seeing none, let's vote. And that passes 5-0. And now we move on to staff presentations, announcements, and requests. Our safety officer, Joe Cavanaugh, will present the list of above and beyond awards for this quarter. Mayor, council members, staff, and all everybody watching at home as well as the audience here, it's my great pleasure again to announce the fourth quarter awards for above and beyond for the Central Safety Committee for the City of Lompoc. This is the period of April, May, and June of 2019. First submitted by Peter Almada, who is a supervisor of solid waste collections, for Gail Greer, the supervisor of solid waste landfill. During heavy winds in April, Gail Greer was observed picking up trash and placing overturned trash cans upright in alleys. He took 20 to 30 minutes to clean up the trash and reduce windblown debris in the alleys. Obviously not his job. It was gonna land up at the, get at the landfill somewhere. He just didn't want the wind to take it there, okay? The next one is Reno Pen Pantoja, South uh, Solid Waste Collections, and this was a nomination by his supervisor, Peter Almada. While driving his solid waste route, Reno was outside his garbage truck when he noticed an electrical fire behind the cab of his truck. He used the fire extinguisher inside the cab of his vehicle to extinguish the fire, saving between fifteen dollars to $60,000 if the cab had burned. Um, and it also saved about two weeks where we would have been, had a vehicle down and had problems making our routes. Third is from Lee Eady and Sarah Blyle from our library, made for Mark Majors, Sam Fast, and Alice Riggs, who are Building and Facilities Maintenance Department. The library experienced flooding in the basement of the building on May 30th, right before closing. Facility staff managed, uh, arranged for the investigation and repair of the line blockage. It was a sewer line. And the cleanup and sanitation of the entire basement. It happens. Street and urban forestry, and this was made by our mayor, Osborne. A citizen with injuries requested repairs to the sidewalk cracks and heaves around her property. She uh, brought the dangerous areas near her home to the attention of Mayor Osborne, who then asked streets and urban forestry to look into it. They were actually able to turn around and do that repair as quickly as possible within a couple of days for that citizen. The next is Jose Lopez, customer service meter reader, and this was made by Chanel Ovalle from a, another employee. Jose Lopez, customer service meter reader, was observed doing weed cleanup around City Hall parking. Meter readers aren't usually around City Hall except to pick up turnoffs or bills or courtesy notices. This activity is not part of his normal work tasks and it was done during his break to provide a cleaner work area. They have these tools in the back of their vehicles, obviously, to be able to reach the meters when there's overgrowth. And finally, Sean O'Neill, Supervisor Urban Forestry, made by his OSA who's retired, uh, Diane Nahira. Auditing an invoice for a city contract, Sean noticed incorrect billing of hours to the contract. Sean's audit and subsequent use of the city's administrative staff and legal re resulted in reduce a reduction of $7,500 to the invoice. It's with great pleasure, and I hope you'll join me in congratulating these wonderful city employees. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kavanaugh, for that, and thank you to all of our employees who continue to go above and beyond in making our community uh, cleaner and safer. And now we have our library director, Sarah Blyle, to give us a presentation on the library sign-up month.
Okay, good evening, Mayor, City Council members, public, everyone here tonight. Um, I am gonna talk about si sign-up month real quick, but also first, I just wanna give um, you guys the stats from our latest summer reading program, uh, which was amazing and successful. Um, so every year we track how many people are signing up. And as you can see, this is our fi the last five years. So five years ago we had 900 people participate, which is not, not bad at all. But this year we had 20, over 2,200, which is absolutely phenomenal growth. It is more than Santa Maria does, just so you know. I like to brag about that all the time. Um, but we have fewer staff and we still get way more people signed up and participating in our programs. So that was a total 2,200. Uh, of course, kids are our number one competitors there. They're, they're all super excited to participate every year. Um, but still, 400 adults, that's really great. We hope to see more of you guys next year. Um, we read a total of 13,374 books. And that's in about two months. So Lompoc Valley area, we are readers. Look at that. Look at all those books that those kids read. Over 10,000, that's amazing. Uh, we had 144 programs, over 7,000 people attended, um, that, which is amazing. Um, if you can see, that middle picture is kind of hard to tell, but we actually had to move one of the programs into the library because the Grossman Gallery wasn't big enough and the lawn wasn't big enough. And so we moved all the tables and chairs out of the middle and we had the program right there. We had about 475 people in attendance. It was the reptile show, which is a big favorite. So over 60,000 people visited the library over the summer. Um, that includes the Village Library and also the Bookmobile. You probably saw the Bookmobile at the um, Old Town Fair every Friday night. Um, we like to do that so more people can use the library. So looking ahead, um, like we said, this month is library card sign-up month. So if you do not have a library card, you just need to come into one of the libraries with uh, your photo ID and proof of address. Um, that can be something that you have on your phone if you have like your bills on your phone or that, that's fine for your address, proof of address. Um, with the library card, if you haven't been in for a couple of years, you might not be in the system anymore. And there's a lot of great things that you can access if you have a library card. Uh, we have streaming movies, we have eBooks. I know that a lot of people download Audible. Well, guess what? You can do the same thing, but for free with your library card. Um, we have programs for all ages. And actually the programs, you don't even need a library card for that. You can just show up to any of our programs. And one of our special programs that we are having September 21st, we received a grant from the California State Library and Story Center to help kids be able to make a short film. So we had 10 films created by local Lompoc kids um, during a two-day workshop over, and they actually used their spring break. So these kids gave up two free days of spring break to come and learn how to write a story and tell a story and then use computers to be able to film and edit. And so we are having our first ever youth filmmaker showcase that night, or that day, sorry, Saturday, September 21st from 1 to 3 p.m. Um, so we'll be showing all their short films, there's 10 of them, and Certain Sparks was actually highlighted in one of the films that one of the kids told um, her story about learning how to play musical instruments. So they are going to be there and they're going to be offering a free group ukulele class before the screening. So the entire public is invited, and I actually have personal invitations for each of you. Thank you. So we hope to see a lot of the public there to celebrate these young filmmakers in our town. And then one of the big programs that we have coming up that we're super excited about, we're gonna be doing STEM um, for teens, for tweens, sorry, fourth through eighth graders, Science Friday. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, if you're not familiar with that lingo. Um, we're gonna be doing some special projects just for those fourth to eighth grade science kids and or that are interested, if you like marshmallows, come on in. Um, we have marshmallow engineering where they're gonna learn how to build with marshmallows and toothpicks. They're gonna be designing kites. I mean, and what a perfect thing for Lompoc with our lovely wind that they will be able to test their designs outside. Um, they're gonna be doing a game design night and also uh, geysers. So kids love to uh, make a mess. So we won't be doing that in the library. It will be outside on the patio. But um, if you have a tween that's interested, please 
no need to sign up, you can just come on in. Those are gonna be the second Friday of the month, um, starting this month, so starting next Friday, Friday the 13th. So if you have any questions or comments, I'm happy to answer anything, but thank you very much, everybody, for supporting us for the summer reading, and come on in and get your library card if you don't already have one. Thank you, Ms. Blau, for running an excellent library and really enticing people to come in and utilize it, and I see that it will continue through the fall, so thank you. Any thank questions you. for our library director? Seeing none, again, thank right. you. Thank you. Next is oral communications regarding any matter of city business that is not on the agenda. You have three minutes, please come forward. Deb Andrews, Mission Hills. I applaud the city council hearing citizen concerns and acting upon those concerns. Thank you. I missed the invocation tonight as the meeting opened. I hope in the future we can get back to having an invocation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Michael Baker, CEO of United Boys and Girls Club, Santa Barbara County. I just wanted to uh, give you an update that uh, this summer was the busiest summer we've had at the Lompoc Boys and Girls Club in a long, long time. Uh, and that has a lot to do with the, with the leadership of the, of the club, and that's Davika Stalling, who's just doing an incredible job there. And I wanted to, uh, those folks that are watching at home and those in the audience, if you know of any child that's in need of Boys and Girls Club services, you just contact the Boys and Girls Club and we'll make sure we get those kids enrolled in our programs, especially the kids that need our services the most, the kids who can't get to the Boys and Girls Club, but we can figure out a way to transport them to and from. So again, I want to encourage you to come down and see uh, the program's in action, a uh, new school year started, and, and we are just swamped with kids in a great way. So again, I want to thank you for your continued support and appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. John Lynn, local resident. I also noticed that we haven't had an invocation for a couple of meetings, so I'm here to volunteer to do the next one, the next meeting. I have some great ones that I saved from way back when, and I would also be willing to assist the mayor in finding some reverends locally that would come and do our invocations, because I was pretty successful at that once before. So my services are available, please call me. Thank you. Seeing no one else rise, we will close oral communications. There is a uh, group that does organize the invocations. They have lost the individual who organizes those, and as a result, we have not had those because, again, it is not something the city itself organizes. It is the religious organizations in the community that do organize it and make the volunteer list and provide the information to us. So if there are those that would like to pick up that missing part of our agenda, within that religious community, please uh, contact me or the city clerk to make those arrangements. And now, the agenda item, public hearing item number three, decision and direction regarding the appeal by the Lompoc Artificial Kidney Center, LLC, of waste discharge permit I-0013 and utility director's revised and reissued ruling on request for reconsideration in accordance with Lompoc Municipal Code sections 1.32.01 zero and one three point one six one three zero from utility director mr brad wilkie council member mosby okay i own property within 500 feet but the city attorney is advised and maybe you could fill in the blanks yes thank you council member mosby first i want to note for the record that council member cordova has left and is no longer uh, on the dais and secondly council member mosby does own property within 500 feet of this um address that we're considering here tonight, the Kidney Center, Lompoc Artificial Kidney Center, LLC. Um, however, uh, under the FPPC regulations, even if the property is within 500 feet of a council member's property, if there is clear and convincing evidence that the council's decision will have no financial impact on the council member's property, then there is not a conflict. And I have advised Council Member Mosby, and he has agreed, that uh, the decision tonight about a wastewater permit and the existence of a water softener at the kidney center 
there is no possibility that that decision can have a financial impact on Councilmember Mosby's property. So for that reason, uh, Councilmember Mosby is not recusing himself tonight. Thank you for that clarification. Mr. Wilkie. Thank you, Mayor Osborne, council members, um, audience. Um, first, thing I want to make a statement about um, the appeal is related to water discharge. It's not in any way, shape, or form addressing the safety of the um, customers of the kidney center. And I state that because um, as the city is under a salt discharge limitation by our NPDES permit, uh, there are nine other kidney centers in the area surrounding Riverside and Santa Clarita that have the same type of salt discharge limitations that we do, and they provide the services to their clientele uh, without issue and are within their waste discharge requirements, each one of them. Um, I also want to make a comment up front is because of the nature of these proceedings and in, in order to protect the due process rights of the appellant, the kidney center, the city attorney was not involved in advising the staff in this matter or in the preparation and review of the staff report. Just want to bring that up um, up front. Um, I'm going to keep my comments brief. Uh, in effect, the uh, request relates to two um, overarching issues. Uh, one, does the kidney center use require a permit? And two, can the kidney center have a water softener? And I'm just gonna go through a couple items that will address both of those items that are the crux of this um, appeal and the process that we've been going through since approximately November. Um, so does the kidney center require a permit? Permits are required for class one industrial users, class two industrial users, and significant industrial users as provided for by our city code. So is the kidney center industrial user? Um, they are an industrial user as defined by the city's code. Defined by an industrial user is generally any discharger of industrial waste or source of indirect discharge. So does the kidney center dispose of industrial waste? The industrial waste means any solid, liquid, or gaseous substance discharged or permitted to flow into the city's sewer from any industrial manufacturing, agricultural, commercial, or business establishment or process, or from the development, recovery, or processing of natural resources. The kidney center is a commercial and business establishment, so their waste is defined as industrial. So is the kidney center a class two user? The kidney center discharges less than 10,000 gallons of water a day and has stated in their baseline monitoring report that their sodium discharge is above the city's discharge limits, uh, 322 units versus 270 units. And their baseline monitoring report states that their chloride discharge is also above the city's discharge limits, 496 units versus the city's limitation of 250. As both reported discharge amounts are above the city's NPDES permit discharge limits, the kidney center is considered a class two user. So is the kidney center a class one user? Um, the kidney center is classified as a significant industrial user as their discharge of sodium and chlorides affects the wastewater treatment plant since their discharge is, is in excess of the city's NPDES, NPDES permits. So that addresses the first issue of whether they require a permit or not. Um, so the second item is can this kidney center have a water softener? Um, the Lompoc Municipal Code section 13.16.320 prohibits the installation, replacement, or enlargement of water softeners unless they meet California Health and Safety sections 116.775 to 116.779. And those sections are referred to residential consumers rather than industrial or commercial users. So the city code prohibits the organization from having a water softener. The city council can modify the Lompoc Municipal Code to allow a higher efficiency water softener, 4,000 grains of hardness removed, um, compared to the existing residential limitation of 2,400 grains per pound uh, removed. 
Um, there's also a definition that's in the code regarding infectious waste, and the Kidney Center and city staff have already agreed that that is something that can be and should be um, modified by the city council for in the um, municipal code. Um, that has not been brought to the water board, which would have to affirm any kind of change uh, until after this process has been uh, finalized. Um, I do want to point out that the Kinney Center has a current application to the building department to expand their operations at the, their existing site. Uh, in discussions with them, they've stated that their daily use, once the expansion is, is operational, will exceed 10,000 gallons a day, which would put them categorically into the, which is the difference between class one and class two users. The 10,000 gallons a day is the dividing point between the two. Um, as provided for in the uh, amendments, the attachments to the staff report, I, I believe the revised and reissued ruling that was provided to the Kidney Center provides them a path for them to provide empirical evidence to the city that their current operational discharge um, would allow them to be removed from um, permit status. But until we get that empirical evidence, um, right now, they are under permit. Um, if they, and I guess the last thing I want to say in this part of it is that uh, as things change, if they do expand as they have proposed in their um, building permit, then we'd have to revisit whether they would continue to be um, needing a permit based on their, that, at that point in time, their discharge, um, constituents. So the um, Kinney Center is here this evening and has a presentation that they would like to provide. I think it's the right time to provide that opportunity. So I'll... Council Member Starbuck. Yeah, Mr. Wilkie, before we go into that, I just had a couple of questions, you know, a little homework on here. It says this was all started with an anonymous complaint. I'm very curious, was this a complaint filed by our staff or was it done by a citizen? It was not done, done by staff. So a citizen filed this complaint? Correct. Okay. Salinity again. I'm very curious, what are we doing to counter salinity that we get from some of the people that we host at our regional plant? I would refer to the village. They just recently imposed a water softener ban and we've been working with them uh, as we go through the uh, pretreatment program in implementation. Um, I was part of a meeting with the uh, staff at the um, Vandenberg Village CSD to discuss their processes. Um, their industrial users are subject to the same limitations that our industrial users are subject to. Uh, so they're, but they're in charge of that side of things. Well, they're in charge of it, but we're running the water plant. So, I mean, are they in the same position, basically? They're just going to go take everybody's water softener out of their place now? I can't speak to what their plan is to reduce their um, salts that are coming to the plant. Do they have a permit? They have a contract with the city. A contract, but not a permit. They have to abide by our same permit levels that we do. But and not a permit, and their industrial users can go. Yes. The Air Force Base is permitted, uh, but the district is not. Okay. Any so. more questions for Mr. Wilkie before the appellant? Okay. Is it loaded? Okay. I'll see if I can find it. Yeah. Let me see if we've got our slides up. That's, that's our list of issues, but I'm not quite there yet. Uh, good evening. My name's Ian Guthrie. I'm an attorney, and I have the privilege of representing the Lompoc Artificial Kidney Center. 
Long Polk, sorry, I'm not from around here. I have with me tonight uh, Dr. Thomas Allen, who's the founder and current director of the Kidney Center, and he's going to be testifying. I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction because I think it's, there's a little complexity here, and then he will explain to you what the dialysis center does, and then I'd like to come back to the podium and address a few legal issues. I, I want to compliment the city of Lompoc on its staff. Mr. Director Wilkie and his staff have been very responsive and helpful. They met with us, provided us with information, and were cooperative and narrowed the issues, and we have a, a one issue left. Uh, we're appealing tonight <clears throat> primarily the issue of whether or not the Lompoc ki the Kidney Center is required to have a permit at all. And the issue is whether their use is industrial or domestic. And there is a definition in your code of domestic use, which basically says residential use or any other use on other premises um, that is for personal or health reasons. And it's hard to imagine what could be more personal than dialysis. So the issue isn't an industrial use. The issue is a dialysis center that provides a service to the patients from Lompoc who can no longer process through their own kidneys human urine. And all we're doing is stepping in and substituting that process. And it's hard to imagine something more personal and domestic and less industrial. And later in the evening, I'll, I'll show you that definition of domestic. Um, these are the issues that we have before us on the appeal. Uh, the first one is the amended definition of infectious waste to clarify the dialysate, dialysate, which Dr. Allen will explain to you is not an infectious waste. And I believe that the city supports that. And the next one is finding that the kidney's current water softener doesn't violate the ordinance. It doesn't. It was adopted in 2015, and our uh, the kidney center's um, softener was last <coughs> upgraded in 2006. And by its own terms, the 2015 ordinance only applies to subsequent upgrades or replacements. So. The current softener is not in violation, but in an effort to try to deal with some of the issues that have been raised, the Kidney Center is willing to upgrade its entire water softening system um, to a higher level of, of efficiency, which will reduce some of the salt. Um, and then the real big issue here is number four, find that the Kidney Center is not required to obtain a wastewater permit. and that turns on two things. First, it's un unnecessary. Um, the Kidney Center has operated since 1998, and its operations have never caused the city's wastewater treatment plant to violate its NPDES permit. And according to most recent tests, you're not even close to that. Um, the federal government regulates wastewater. They set limits on pollutants. So those pollutants include salts, and the um, actual standards are, are set forth for sodium chloride, which is dissolved salt, and TDS. And so we'll be looking at some of those numbers tonight. Those um, requirements coming from the federal government are enforced by the Regional Water Quality Control Board, and the Lompoc Treatment, Water Treatment Center is subject to the NPDES permit, where it has to stay within certain limits. You're well within those limits. Um, neither the spirit or the letter of the ordinance requires a permit. The spirit of the ordinance is embodied in at the beginning of the sewer uh, ordinance, and it talks about the purposes. And the main purposes is to make sure that the city doesn't violate its NPDES uh, permit. And as I've said, it doesn't. Um, the um, and also, we're within the letter of the ordinance because, as um, uh, Director Wilkie said, the issue is industrial and we're not an industrial use. And I'd like to now look at the process, and Dr. Allen is going to go through this in more detail, um, but it confused me, so maybe it'll confuse you. Um, over here on the left, we get the kidney center gets its water 
<clears throat> from city water. The biggest contributor to the salt load at the water treatment plant is the city's own water softening process. And that's nobody's fault. You have hard water to make that <clears throat> useful to your citizens. Um, the city uh, pre-softens it. And that softening process uses salt, and that contributes about 75% of the entire salt load. So in the staff report, they talk about <clears throat> the potential for violating the permit. Um, the kidney center is a trivi trivial contributor. The best way, according to your own salt study, to deal with this would be back off on your salt uh, use for, for softening purposes or start installing some um, microfilters to remove that at, at the end of the line. So this water clearly has to be specially treated before it can be used for dialysis, so it needs to be softened. <clears throat> One of the issues has been this softener. It's not an exchange tank softener. It's not the kind of softener that they remove once a month or so. It's a self-regenerating softener. So it has a brine tank. It periodically regenerates, and when it does, uh, it uh, drains to the sewer, and it does drain some salts to the sewer. Uh, the softening process itself then uh, as it um, softens the water by removing the calcium and magnesium, uh, it, it releases sodium and chloride ions. So the softening process um, contributes some salt, but not a lot. A lot of our discussions with the city staff has been over this system. And um, I think that when Director Wilkie talks about the other five uh, jurisdictions, and we haven't seen those reports, but what I've heard is they use exchange tanks here. We don't want to do that because we're concerned about the being able to control <coughs> the contamination, but also, to be honest, it wouldn't make much difference because the salt um, that the, uh, the kidney center uses comes from the simple fact that your blood is salty. Our blood is 11 times more salty than the NPDES salt limits. And so after the softened water is filtered, which doesn't affect it, it goes into a reverse osmosis machine. And that machine, about 25% of the water that goes in, goes down a drain, and it is scraped off all the remaining minerals, much of which were received from the city, and some salt. And this is where um, the city staff was able to test, but that's a very concentrated point, so it's not a fair testing point. Then the reverse osmosis machine basically creates super pure water. And it goes to a dialysate tank. And this is the issue. Your blood, as I said, is salty. If they tried to do dialysis with pure water, the patients would die. It can't be done until they match the salinity of the dialysate solution to the salinity and pH of your blood. And they do that by putting in electrolytes. Well, what are electrolytes? Electrolytes are salts. So <clears throat> the, um, the dialysate, which is what we call this water, then goes to the um, patient. And Dr. Allen will explain to you what happens when we get there. Ready, Doc? Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members. What we're gonna talk, what, let me just tell you a little bit about who I am. Um, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Kidney Center. Um, I was trained at my BA is from Northwestern, my MD is from Columbia, and my further training was done at the Mass General and Harvard Medical School. I've been in Santa Barbara County since 1981, and I've been associated with this project since 1998. My board certifications are in internal medicine and nephrology, and nephrology is the care and management of patients with medical renal disease, not surgical renal diseases. What the kidneys do, is, and 
what they do is really very remarkable because they clean your blood. They're sort of the body's wastewater treatment plant. But they figure out how much water you need and you get rid of the rest. They figure out how much salt you need, they get rid of the rest. And they get rid of a, a number of metabolic waste products which you can't live with if you don't get rid of them. So when the kidneys fail, all of these processes get screwed up. You start retaining fluid, your blood pressure goes up, you may go into congestive heart failure, and the waste build up as well. And by the time you get down to about 10% of your kidney function, you start to get sick. And when you get sick, you're in need of what we call renal replacement therapy, which means you need to either go on dialysis or get scheduled if, for a transplant if you're, if you're eligible. So when that comes along and that happens to you, what you really need is an artificial kidney, something to take the place of your kidneys, which no longer work. So the typical dialysis patient has to come to a dialysis center three times a week for dialysis sessions, which are three or four hours in duration. And this occurs at the Lompoc Artificial Kidney Center, currently operating 17 hours a day, six days a week. And when you come in to the dialysis center, you have the machines, this is a typical dialysis machine. This is a typical dialysis chair, which you would sit in. And when you sit in that chair, your blood is accessed usually from a vein in the forearm. It goes through this circuit with using the blood pump to push the blood through. And it goes through this artificial kidney or dialyzer, as we call it goes back around and back into you. At any given time, there are just a few ounces of blood outside the body, um, but it's a way of us cleaning your blood. And the way that's done is we use a, this solution called dialysate, and the dialysate flows in one direction, the blood flows in the other, and exchange takes place across what we call a semi-permeable membrane so that things that are high in the blood, like urea and potassium, will move into the dialysate, and things that are low in the blood will move in the opposite direction. <clears throat> so as Mr. Guthrie just explained, what we do is we take city water, we heat it up a bit because it makes the membranes more, more responsive. It's softened using this brine uh, generated water softener. Mr. Guthrie spoke to the exchange tanks. The other th thing that may come up is somebody will say, well, why don't you use potassium chloride? Well, potassium is lethal for dialysis patients, so if anything goes wrong in that process, you may end up with some patients who are seriously injured or killed. So potassium is really out of the question. So as we go through this, I'm sorry, <clears throat> as we, As we go through this and make our dialysate, we add all of these electrolytes, and this dialysis solution, the dialysate then goes to the dialysis machines, and it's what we use to clean the patient's blood. So if we look at the salinity involved in all of this, if we look at human blood, human blood has 2,990 milligrams of sodium per liter, 3,500 milligrams of chloride. Human urine is very much the same. And urine concentrations of, of sodium and chloride depend on a couple of things. One is how much do you eat and how much do you drink? So you come up with a fairly wide range here. The dialysate, when we mix it, comes out to 3,151 milligrams of sodium and 4,795 4, milligrams of chloride. But when the water we use for dialysate uh, mixing is about half of the water we use, and we use between 8,200 gallons and 8,500 gallons per day. So the other half of the water just goes down the drain and dilutes 
this dialysate by at least 50%. So leaving, leaving the machines and diluted by the rest of our wastewater, dialysate adjusted sodium would be 1,575 milligrams per liter and the chloride would be 2,397 per liter. The <clears throat> comments that I would make about that are that the dialysis sodium is a necessary part of what we do. Without being able to mix dialysate that's compatible with the patient's blood, the patients can't be dialyzed. So there's really no way around it for us to lower the salt leaving the dialysis center. But let's put that all in perspective. The dialysis center uses 8,200 to 8,500 gallons a day. Wastewater treats 2,900,000 gallons of water every day. Our wastewater stream, our amount of sodium, gets diluted by this nearly 3 million gallons of water. So by the time it gets to the wastewater plant, it's almost not measurable. It's an absolutely minuscule contribution to the wastewater salt stream. So it's a little hard to get excited about the sodium level leaving the building. But it is important to think about the sodium level reaching the wastewater plant. And our contribution is negligible. So. Sure. What you're going to talk about is I'm sorry, you need to return to the microphone if you're going to ask questions. Sure. Thank you. Is um, the kidney center's dialysis system, is it regulated by anyone? Two, response, <clears throat> two responses to that. The water system that we use to prepare the dialysate is an F FDA approved uh, water processing system. And the kidney center is very highly regulated by the California Department of Health and by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. How long has the center been in operation? Center did its first patients in 1998 and has been in continuous operation since then. And where are the next nearest um, dialysis centers? Closest centers to Lompoc would be Santa Maria and Santa Barbara. How many patients does the center treat? Currently, we treat uh, about 130 patients. We do about 1,600 treatments a month. And you mentioned that you use approximately 8,500 gallons of water versus the city's processing 2,900,000. You know what percentage that represents? I think it's 0.29 or 0.3% of the total water processed by the wastewater treatment plant. Okay. And um, you are going to be doing some upgrading uh, of the system. Can you speak to that? Yeah, we're perfectly happy to upgrade the, the softener to the 4,000 grains of hardness per pound of salt. Um, and let me clear up a, a, another per, potential misconception here. We're in the process of expanding the dialysis center to meet the needs of this community for the next 10 or 20 years. It's not just because we add another 18 stations and bring it up to 36 stations, doesn't mean we're gonna fill those 36 stations right away. They're gonna be grown into. So it's not as if the day we get our certificate of occupancy that our water use is gonna double. It's gonna gradually increase over the next five to 10 years. Will the, the, are you going to be using new machines uh, as you upgrade, and um, will they use water more efficiently? Uh, the water system will be upgraded, and it will be far more efficient than the water system we currently have. So just because we're doubling the number of, of machines, the amount of water use will probably go up by about 30%. Why not, um, why not use exchange tanks? When you use exchange tanks, you have no idea where they've been, you have no idea about their sterility, and you have no idea what contaminants they, they might harbor. And these particular patients on dialysis are extremely vulnerable. These people don't just have kidney failure. 
They have hypertension, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, many have had heart attacks, quite a number of them have had amputations. So these are very frail patients for the most part. And you don't want to expose them to any unnecessary risks. So what would be the cost of putting it in the exchange tanks if you could do that? Uh, we looked into all this. The exchange tanks will require a $50,000 fit to make it work, and then it'll cost us an additional $3,000 a month uh, to do that. So first year, $86,000. So would that solve the problem if you put in exchange tanks? It really doesn't, because it doesn't address the issue of the dialysate salt that's added to the wastewater stream. And there's kind of a misconception about water softeners. When the water softener works, the way it works is calcium comes in, the water softener grabs it, and puts it in, in, into the water softener, but it, to do that, it releases sodium. That's how every water softener in the world works. In order for it to work, it's got to grab something, but in grabbing something, it lets something go. So exchange tanks, brine tanks, it's all very much the same. Is there any way to remediate the dialysate um, levels of sodium and chloride? Well, you really can't. You have to match the sodium and chloride and other minerals that are in the patient's blood. Because if you do otherwise, you may cause their red cells to blow up or you may cause them certain other toxicities by mismatching the electrolytes in the dialysate and in the patient's blood. Um, the current softener, was that last upgraded in 2006? It's either 2002 or 2006. Okay. And do you know what the current efficiency of that softener, the current softener is? It's uh, 2,500 grains per pound of uh, salt. And what would be the efficiency of the softener you're um, agreeing to put in there? It would be 4,000 grains per pound. Thank you, Dr. Allen. So, I think to put this in perspective, we can look at some pie charts that come out of, well, first, this is the definition of infectious waste. And the only thing that we're asking to be changed is down here on item E, where it says human dialysis waste materials, including arterial, arterial lines and dialysable membranes. Now, the arterial lines and dialysable membranes are solid, uh, pieces and they're disposed of through a licensed medical waste disposal. But the dialysis uh, is not. And the dialysis, and I should have had the doctor testify to this, but I think he would agree with me, that um, the dialysate never touches your blood. What passes through is urea and potassium, and so the dialysate is the electrolytes with the water and the urea that the person otherwise would excrete through uh, the sewer system at their home. And so we're just asking that it be clarified, and I believe the city agree, the city director believes, but excluding uh, new or used dialysate. So that's that issue. This, these charts, and they aren't as easy to read as I had hoped, but they come out of a salt salinity study done by the city, and the first pie chart is all the contributions of TDS, total dissolved solids, which is some indicator of salinity uh, at your wastewater treatment plant. And 88% of it is attributable to the city's own waste, uh, its own softening program. The next one is the contribution to the chlorides, and that figure is 69% of it is a result of the city's own water treatment. And then on the sodium, <clears throat> that's 75% of the sodium load um, comes from the city's own treatment. So in the SALT study, it said because the salt is coming from the city's own softening, the best way to deal with it is at that level, but there are expenses to that because you'd need to put in microfilters or RO exchanges. But you could control it that way, and it would probably be a better investment because as you can see, these are, I think one of the council members asked about Vandenberg. I think 
uh, there's a piece of the pie chart that relates to the estimate of all the water softeners in Vandenberg, and so water softening just isn't a major impact. Um, so this is the policy of your ordinance. This is a direct quote um, out of the ordinance, and it talks about the purpose of the policy, excuse me. And it talks about in item A, prevent the introduction of pollutants which will interfere. That's a defined term, and that means that would cause the city to be out of compliance with its own permit. Nothing we've done in all the years of our operation has ever caused the city to be out of uh, compliance with its own permit. B, prevent the introduction of pollutants which will pass through the treatment works or otherwise be incompatible. Again, when you look at the actual definition of that, it means it would put you out of compliance with the NPDES permit, which has never happened. These other two improve opportunities to recycle and reclaim and prevent exposure to wastewater workers to chemical hazards, neither of those apply. So none of the purposes um, for which the ordinance is adopted are uh, really applied to us. And then <clears throat> this is significant um, because the city has, the director has expressed in his report or the staff report concerns about violating the limits. So these are the actual limits right out of uh, the city, city's NPDES permit, and it's limited at the wastewater treatment center to 988 milligrams per liter uh, TDS, 206 of chloride, and 190, uh, excuse me, here are the limits. I got this wrong. The limit for TDS in your permit is 1100, for sodium it's 270, for chloride it's 250. You can see that you're well within all of this. The only one that's close is TDS. Uh, you're within, you're only 90% to the limit. On sodium and chloride, you're far, far from the limit. Something else that the staff had in their report was the comment that the current permit has expired, which it has, and that there will be a new permit, which there will be, and then the staff opined that there might be a different standard. We, we can't tonight uh, enforce a standard we don't know that exists. So um, this shows that, you, that nothing that the, uh, the Kidney Center has been doing all these years has caused any impact on, your, on the city's own permit. Uh, and then here's the actual permit requirement. And this is what Director Wilkie was speaking to. You're required if you're a class one user, class two user, uh, and then there's a separate uh, definition of significant industrial user. Class one, class two, significant industrial user, they're all industrial users. So, but as I've pointed out, these are the actual definitions and <clears throat> Director Wilkie spoke about this one. Industrial waste means any solid, liquid, or gaseous substance discharged or permitted to flow into the city sewer from any industrial, manufacturing, agricultural, commercial, or business establishment or process or from the development, recovery, or processing of any natural resource. So the director's position is that um, because we are a business, uh, that we are, that, that by definition, uh, the dialysate is industrial waste. But the <coughs> ordinance also includes this uh, definition of domestic wastewater. And do what the domestic wa wastewater means wastewater from residences and other premises derived from personal use of water for washing or sanitary purposes. So it's not just homes, it's other premises uh, derived from personal use of water, and as I said at the beginning, it's hard to imagine a more pu personal use of water than dialysis treatment. And that is why we believe that the dialysate uh, wastewater is, should be classified as domestic wastewater and why no permit is necessary. Now this is an, an issue of interpretation of the statute, and that's up to the council. Uh, the uh, director has focused on the business. I think it's more appropriate to f focus on the nature of the waste because that's what we're really trying to control. 
And the nature of the waste isn't something that is uh, subject to an industrial process. The nature of the waste is a process of relieving people of urine and urea and um, chemicals that they can't, can no longer process on their own. Um, I don't believe that this, the, the current um, softener uh, is subject to regulation, but the uh, kidney center is willing to upgrade that, but it can't really upgrade it until it finds out what's gonna happen with the permit, because upgrading that system is gonna be expensive and it's not gonna solve the fundamental problem that dialysate by its very nature is salty, and that problem can only be solved by this council, and I think it's entirely appropriate to interpret the statute um, uh, as uh, defining human dialysis waste as domestic wastewater. And that's it. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Any questions for the appellant or staff? Seeing none, we will open this up for public comment. You have three minutes. Please step forward if you wish to speak on this matter. Good evening, council members. John Lynn Lompoc, resident. The NPDES permit repeatedly states that its purpose is that residual materials in the discharge water from the wastewater plant shall not, quote, cause nuisance or, ad or adverse effect the beneficial use of the water. There's nothing within what they do that does that. The Kidney Center opened in 1997 and has been discharging relatively the same waste into the st plant stream ever since and accounts for slightly more than one quarter of 1%. Clearly it has not impacted it in the past and it has not impacting it now. So what changed? Last November, this controversy began and it's like the others that have come before you because a different interpretation was made of the ordinances that we have. Now I agree with the mayor, some of our ordinances with regard to this need some polishing and that might have helped, but certainly better interpretation could have been made along the way. Next staff has completely misunderstood Assembly Bill 1366, dealing with water softeners, which authorized local agencies to limit residential water softeners under certain conditions. And Lompoc met those conditions. But if you read 1366, and I have, I think it says residential 11 times, but it was a little while ago, so I might be off by one or two. But the city sought to apply 1366 to this in error because it never applied. It only applied to residential softeners. As a matter of fact, in the state constitution, there is the right to have a softener to provide potable water. Next, the staff composed a discharge permit, which is more stringent than the permit required by NPDES. The kidney center is described as it is an industrial use, but it's not, and as they pointed out, the city code provides for this to be considered a residential use on interpretation. So let me make it just very simple. If you or I go into the restroom at our home and pee in the toilet, that goes to the wastewater plant. If your kidneys have failed, you can't do that. So you go to their center and they process your blood and then they pee, your pee goes into their sewer. It's no different than what would happen at your house. Now, I'm sure you understand the dialysis process clearly now. And I want, the thing I brought, provided to you was what our TDS levels are throughout our system. And I'd hope you would each read it now. I see my time is up. 
I'll impose it on you for 10 seconds. Finally, the long alluded to EPA letter provided in the staff report says, the presentation of areas of concern does not constitute a formal compliance determination. In other words, more review is required and it is what the EPA does. They come through and start looking at things. So thank you for your time. Thank you. If you would like to speak, please go ahead and move to the mic. Madam Mayor, City Council members, um, I don't have any fancy slides and I don't have any charts with lots of numbers, but I am one of the faces of the 130 some people that do have dialysis three times a week at the Lompoc Dialysis Center. Um, I have been a patient since 2014 and without the center, I wouldn't be here. Uh, I intend to live for several more years. I have grandchildren to watch grow up, including a set of four-year-old twins that are very mischievous and just fun to watch. But anyhow, that's all I wanted to say. I am the face of, I can't say typical dialysis patient. Many of them are a lot younger than I am. But the center is keeping me alive and keeping dozens of other people alive. Um, going to Santa Barbara, Santa Maria is not an option. Their, their centers are packed. So it's something that, that needs to be, I don't know if the word is compassionate use to, to make some kind of a, a, an agreement with the center so that, um, they can continue to operate and that, uh, uh, people like me can continue to live. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Hi, good evening, Mayor and Council and the people, the public. My name is Marlene, I'm the head nurse and the clinical manager of Lompoc Artificial Kidney Center for 20 years now, ever since we opened 1998. And I just want to let Everybody know that we are proud to have a dialysis here in Lompoc. And uh, for the 600 plus dialysis centers here in California, Lompoc Artificial Kidney Center is a five star facility. And we are proud of that. And there's a lot of people that does not know Lompoc, but once they come here and they need dialysis, they ended up coming here. And they're so happy and proud and we take care of them with excellence, compassionate, and of course, all the safety that's needed. And I just wanna thank you for looking at what is going on right here. We're here for patients' lives. You know. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kim Resident. Council members and mayor, public. Um, my mother is on dialysis, although she doesn't use the one here in Lompoc. Um, I think that the compassion part and it being personal, it's personal to me and I'm not the one on dialysis. But uh, it, I know that my mom would not be here without the dialysis. She would last two to two and a half weeks without it. And I think that whatever they need should be done. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else rise, we'll close public comment and bring it back to council for discussion. Council Member Mosby. Yeah. <clears throat> to the council, I wanted to provide some other documents that one of the reasons why we're even discussing this is because of the quality of our groundwater and how it's uh, progressed. And one of the things we haven't really been addressing over the years, we've been more focused on 
quantity of water coming into our aquifer, not quality. And uh, I have a, two pages here. One is the Watershed Sanitary Survey Update uh, from February 2006. This is for the San Inez River above Bradbury Dam. Um, and you see what, what the water quality is at Kachuma Lake and the total TDS running between five and 600 part per millions. So our wells are about twice that. So a lot of the good water is being held up there, which make a difference. And what I'm pointing out here is, is the valley has become a, a victim, a much larger victim with our, our groundwater modifying, which is causing one of the issues that we have here. And if you wanna read it up, give that to the city clerk. One of the other components is having is uh, a readout of a um, older report, uh, it's called the Lompoc Project from April 1968. And the reason why I bring this up is because this report is, is um, addresses components prior to the 1952-53 uh, dam being built in Kachuma Lake Foreman. Uh, and it says, for individual wells from which samples were taken for analysis, the sulfate content has increased as much as 400 parts per million, and the chloride content has increased as much as 280 parts per million since 1934. Um, the total dissolved solids in water prior to the treatment has increased from an average of 806 parts per million in 1945 to 1,325 parts per million in 1965. Now we're kind of maxing out at that same number and maybe improving a little bit, but the reason why I point this out is there's, there's other components that are, that are larger than just a dialysis center that's been affecting the Valley of Lompoc. And if we were able to have some of that 600 part per million water, I think it'd be a lot easier for them to treat their facility and treat their, their salt. But what I see what's happening here is the valley has become a victim and we're kind of victimizing the victim here uh, on top of this. And what, what, what I challenge to the, I'll give this two pages here to the city clerk as well, um, is to challenge staff of how do we get to yes. Um, I think this is one of the complexities that, that a lot of times it's easy to say no, but I think sometimes it's difficult to get to yes. And I believe staff has tried, and um, I believe with some, some help of the attorney, I see we have Mr. Pannoni here as well, can help. Hopefully we can mediate this and get, get this resolved so that we don't violate our agreement with the state. But we most definitely have to understand the compassionate component and the fact that, that people without this facility would, would not be alive. And that's the service that they are providing here is, is huge. And what is the cost benefit component uh, involved in here versus, versus what? And I think an important factor is that the water that's leaving the wastewater plant, that the beneficial uses are still being maintained. And it's important to understand that we're not putting something out there that is completely over the top. Uh, in fact, you'll see that our, our releases are actually better than the water that we're pulling out of the ground. And it's, and it's a juggling component, how can we get to that and how can we get to accepting and whether we, we have some mo modifications and acceptance of definitions as was described here um, by the appellant. And I believe, um, I believe we can get to, to uh, some conclusion here. I know there was a mention of the, the softener. Was that something that, that, that staff, I don't know, uh, is that a component that would work for us? The, the softener that they said they'd be willing to put in if we were able to find a way to allow them to put in the, the upgraded softener? The underlying um, permit levels that the city abides by, um, that would have to be, still be abided by from the discharge from the center. So I can't answer that question. I'm sure it would be more efficient than it is now but ultimately the uh, permit that we are abiding by would still have to be abided by with or without the higher efficiency unit. And we'd, we would need to have uh, empirical evidence that they're meeting our discharge limits that are part of our NPDES permit. In, in one of that complications, I believe, was the acceptance of putting in an, an, an inspection portal outside so it could be inspected, is that was one of the that that was a recommendation. They they don't need to have a um, sampling station, but the the permit requires that a uh, periodic report is provided to the city with a representative sample from their um, use um, as part of their reporting 
to determine whether they need to have a permit or not. And that was part of the ruling was to provide empirical evidence that shows that they do not have to be permitted um, as a way to, as a path to um, remove the permit obligation. So, uh, Mr. Wilkie, if maybe I could clarify and maybe help the council. I believe I saw in the documentation in the staff report that the staff was willing to accept uh, a new water softening system that would uh, meet the criteria of more than 4,000 grains of hardness removed per pound of salt used. I think that's still staff's position, but then the issue would be staff needs to have some way to determine that they are meeting that even after they install the new system, which is the monitoring requirement that staff was asking for. Okay. That was one component. One was the other, uh, maybe Mr. Malawi can, um, is the infectious waste component, that was a determination in the report we were, looks like staff was willing to um, accept the, the modification. Yeah, as I understood it in all the communications to the appellant, staff said that they would be supportive uh, and recommend to the council to amend the definition of infectious waste to remove dialysis waste so that that would no longer be prohibited uh, from being discharged into the sewer system. And I believe that is still staff's opinion. I'd like to add on to that, that it's not, that is absolutely true. Uh, there is one caveat though, is that the uh, Regional Water Board would also have to opine on that um, change in the municipal code. Okay, the city attorney on 13, 16, 20, purpose and policy was discussed. Um, it, it seemed like they had a compelling argument um, that they weren't interfering with the purpose or policy? Is, is that something that the council would be able to accept their argument or do you feel? Well, I'm gonna use my experience in the courtroom here to tell you what I think a judge would do when, it's, when the judge is trying to interpret our ordinance. So we do have a statement of purpose and policy in 1316.020 as you pointed out but what a statement of purpose and policy really is, is the council when they're adopting this ordinance is saying, these are the goals that we want to uh, pursue or meet by adopting this whole ordinance. And the way we're going to meet those goals and purposes and purposes and policies is by creating all these rules that come after it. So one of the rules that was created is the requirement in, uh, I believe it's 13.16.140, for all class one and class two users to have wastewater permits. Uh, so then we get into whether the dialysis center is a class two user or a class one user. Let's look at the class two user first. Um, Class two user means any user who discharges industrial wastes of less than 10,000 gallons per day and whose discharge may exceed applicable regulations, standards, or limitations. The, ap the appellant's been focusing on whether they discharge industrial waste. So, so overall, the answer to your question is the policy statements do not control. It's the rules that are adopted after the policy statements that control. So we have to look at the rule. And then you have to look at, in that rule, whether the dialysis center uh, discharges industrial waste. If they do, that requires a permit. The definition of industrial waste is any solid, liquid, or gaseous substance discharged or permitted to flow into a city sewer from any industrial, manufacturing, agricultural, commercial, or business establishment or process. And it goes on. 
I cannot right now find a way to get around that definition. There is a separate definition of domestic uh, waste in the ordinance, but the word domestic waste is not used in the definition of a class two user. Class two user is defined as someone who discharges industrial waste. And industrial waste is liquid substances discharged into the sewer from any commercial or business establishment. To me, if I'm sitting as a judge, I would, I don't know if I can find a way around tonight, and it's up to the council to decide whether they can, uh, to decide that this facility is not discharging industrial waste. Okay, and their argument about domestic water versus, or domestic waste water versus the nature of the waste component? There is a separate definition in the ordinance for domestic waste, and that is wastewater from residences and other premises derived from personal use of water for washing or sanitary purposes. I think it's the other premises kind of conflicts is because if it didn't have that in there, it wouldn't really open end it to potential for a medical or, or, or life safety component. There what, is, there, what else there, would other there premises? Is, there is an interpretation. You, you can interpret it um, in multiple ways. Uh, Wastewater from residences and other premises derived from personal use of water. Are the clients at a dialysis center, which is a commercial establishment, uh, using water, is, is that a personal use of water? To me, and the council can, is free to disagree with me, but personal use of water means someone who is using water for themselves, or uh, placing water on themselves for some personal purpose. And I just think that the industrial waste definition is much more suited to what we're dealing with here with a commercial business establishment as opposed to a personal use of water in a residence or other premise. But that is only my interpretation, and the council is free to disagree. And I guess the other premises component is the one that, that kind of opens it up um, to me. Um, and then, like I say, getting back to the other side is the, the commercial component. And I guess the commercial component meaning it's for money, right? Generating a, a business component to the commercial, right? I mean... That's how I interpret commercial, yes, as a service or good provided in exchange for money. So, I mean, that's kind of the two potential gray areas. Well, um. Council, if, if I may throw one out there too, is, and I look to the doctor here because I'm not familiar enough, but do they not have home dialysis units also? That you could be considered personal use with a home dialysis unit too. That would be their personal use of water, so. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm... If you're going to respond, we do require you to step to the microphone simply because of the recording of the event. Let me address your, your question. Dialysis can be done at home. It can be done with a hemodialysis machine or it can be done with what we call peritoneal dialysis. However, in order to do home hemodialysis, it would require putting a water softener in... <laughs> A salt-based water softener in each of the homes where you would do the home dialysis. So, and wouldn't the waste from the home be the same basic waste as from the, your your business right now? I, I think two things get lost here. One is the discharge from the dialysis center is basically the equivalent of urine. No more, no less. Not toxic. Not infectious to anybody else. It's just urine. And the other thing that gets lost here is our salt and 
our sodium and chloride discharge is always going to be higher than those NPDES standards. But it gets diluted on the way to the plant to a point where you could barely measure it. So in, in dealing with this, I think you have to deal with the fact that the salt discharge is going to be high. So we have to get around that. And then the other thing is, it's just urine, so it's very much like domestic waste. So if you had a public shower right next to your facility, you could potentially flush it down with uh, cleaner water and, and well, dilute it before it went into the system, right? Well, that, that happens now because about half the water goes to make dialysate. The other half is for all kinds of other things, and the, they intermingle on the way to the, to the street. Real quick, so that's sort of my point was it's hard to, um, as the city attorney was saying, it's hard to change what this version is of industrial waste, but if you look at domestic waste, uh, essentially what's coming out is what would come out of a domestic home also. So I don't know if there's a way, if you modified industrial waste to incorporate that part or you modify the domestic waste. I want to make it clear um, because Director Wilkie was talking about it and we've talked about the water softeners. That's not the problem. We'll upgrade the water softener, but we, we won't meet those NPDES standards at the sewer line because urine and blood and dialysis all have 10 to 11 times those standards. So <clears throat> that's why you have to interpret this statute. You are the judge and it's your job here to interpret the statute. And the answer is, how do you interpret the definitions that we have on one of our slides of domestic wastewater and industrial waste? And <clears throat> basically, it's up to you. And city council is correct. When a judge is trying to interpret the statute, he looks at its purpose. That's why we stress the purpose. The purpose is that you don't violate your permit. We know that allowing the kidney center to continue won't violate your permit your your permit so in interpreting that you should keep that in mind and then domestic wastewater definitely says other per premises derived from personal use so the problem is if if you interpret that the kidney center is a domestic use then we don't need a permit if you determine it's industrial use we can't meet the standards not because of the water softening but because of the nature of dialysate and um, we have no idea how to do that or what it would cost. Councilmember Vega. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, thank the Dialysis Center for what you do. I've actually seen the process and I see that people, uh, it's a necessary um, process to keep people alive. And, and improve their quality of life and their dignity. So I applaud you. I'd like to ask for assistance from the city attorney here. I'd like to uh, walk through a couple of things that I've listened to here. I'd like to see if we can come up with a motion together on my own part. So from what I've been listening to, it looks like for the following reasons and others, staff has found that the processing and use of water for dialysate does not constitute a, a medical waste. Um, and maybe you could confirm this with me, uh, Mr. City Attorney, as I go through this, so I make sure that I'm not going off on a tangent in the staff report. Or I can go through a couple of them, then we can go through it. I think it might be good to go one by let one. Me, let me go a couple. Okay, go ahead. If you'd like to go a couple, you can go a couple. Okay. Um, the use of dialysate removes impurities in the blood normally accomplished by the kidneys and excreted through urination. Urination is the use of water for a sanitary purpose, whether in a residence or other premises. And any other good reasons the staff uh, could provide and inter, you know, interject here because we're here working together for the common goal of the kidney center and for the dignity of the patients. I think we're all on the same page here. Um, for the reasons in the, in the staff report, processed waters and new and used dialysate water are not a medical waste. I'd like to say, if we amend the Lompoc Municipal Code so that the salt-based water softeners installed for commercial and industrial uses 
after October 1st, 2019, with an efficiency of 4,000 grains of hardness removed per pound of salt used and which generate less than 5% of the wastewater plant volume do not require a wastewater discharge permit. Amend the definition of domestic wastewater. To read means wastewater from residences and other premises derived from personal use of water for washing or sanitary, sanitary purposes, including the processing of water for dialysate and its use. And, and I'm kind of, if you could kind of go along with me here, uh, Mr. City Attorney, to see if I've gone askew here. I mean, I've given a couple of alternatives, a couple of ways we can amend the Lompoc Municipal Code to see if that's something we can do. I'd like to create that and turn that into a motion if you don't object. Uh, the only thing that I will say is that any amendment that the city council is going to recommend to the wastewater ordinance is going to have to be approved by the Regional Water Quality Control Board and uh, they may or may not approve that ordinance that's not up to the city to decide but uh, we would have to present it to them, propose what we're proposing to change and get their approval before we adopted it. Uh, staff has agreed in its communications with the appellant that <clears throat> if um, that staff would be supportive of removing dialysis waste from the definition of infectious waste uh, under the ordinance. And as far as the other amendments that you posed, I would look to staff, wastewater staff, for a response as to whether that would solve uh, the issues that they are dealing with here with the waste, I mean with the uh, dialysis center, or whether uh, some of those amendments that you're posing would not get around some of the requirements uh, that staff is required to follow by the NPDES permit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, basically, what I'd like to do is move forward with this. We can bring staff up here to see whether they agree with moving forward and turning it into and defining it as domestic wastewater, which would change the definition of what we're doing here. Uh, I think that's where we have, uh, yes, I know there's a play between industrial, commercial, and domestic, and whether we put dialysate into that definition which takes us out of the permit, needing a permit. Um, so I'd like to, uh, we can bring up the staff if you'd like, but basically what I'd like to do is I'd like to uphold the Lompoc Artificial Kidney Center's appeal with these changes and whether we have to go to the wastewater board or whatever, I'd like to make that motion and see how we can formulate and move that forward. So, Councilmember Vega, you still have the floor. Uh, yes, Councilmember yes. Starbuck is waiting to speak, so I don't hear a second yet, so you might yield the floor for further discussion, and you may end up with your second, but I have yeah. not heard a second at okay. the moment. Okay, like, maybe we, I can yield it for further discussion if there's something, some input that the wastewater, but I think we need to make some sort of motion and move forward instead of sitting there staring at our light. We need to make some recommendations so we can move forward for the Olympic Municipal Court so we can change it so it's not designated as an industrial use. I understand, but there may be other questions some of the other council may have wanted to ask. Council Member Starbuck. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I was just going to make a couple of comments. <clears throat> I can't believe that I've spent an hour now talking about salt, probably one of the most common elements on earth. Air, salt, everywhere. I I'm curious to know, 600 plus other dialysis centers in the state of California and I've spent an hour talking about urine here. What are the rest of them doing? Why are we having this issue? Is it just us? Or is this happening throughout the state? Is everybody changing water softeners? They're probably doing grease traps at the same time. I'm going to throw in my support on, on Council Member Vega's motion here so far. This property is not zoned industrial. It doesn't have the sewer capacity to be industrial. We're talking discharging water, diluted urine, and oh, the <laughs> salt, by the way. It's not industrial waste, common sense. You know, 
We're not doing chemicals. We're not separating things. I see where staff, is at the very beginning of the staff report, would be willing to change the ordinance. It says here, direct staff to return with an ordinance to amend the municipal code. So I mean, I think it's all doable. I don't really think that the Regional Water Control Board is so idiotic to think that a few extra parts per million of salt out of a dialysis center is going to sink the sewer plant in Lompoc. It's just, you know, it's communication. I know we've communicated with them before, so I'm sure we could do it again. So I will give you a second after the discussion, Council Member Vega. Council Member Mosby. To the city attorney with <clears throat> the motion that's on the floor, is there, are there other parts or components that you might recommend to be added uh, to that? Does that meet the requirements that were needed? What I recall from the motion is to amend the definition of industrial waste and or domestic waste uh, so that a discharger uh, could you help me with that again, Council Member Vega? You, 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 you stated some criteria. Yes, sir. I put the domestic, uh, whether we put industrial or domestic wastewater, I think the definition needs to be changed to means wastewater from residences and other premises derived from personal use of water for washing or keyword sanitary purposes, which include the processing of water for dialysate and its use, because it's basically going to the bathroom. Okay. Um, that, was, that was one of them, uh, Mr. City no, no, that, That's okay. what I was looking for. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, there are some other parts of the ordinance that I would want to, that definition I, I understand and um, the code can be amended that way. There are other parts of the code that I would want to clarify, like the definition of industrial waste, I would want to say does not include anything defined as domestic waste and other legal clarifications like that to make sure that the ordinance is clear, clearly doing what the council intends for it to do through Councilmember Vega's motion. Uh, I think Councilmember Vega's motion also included removing uh, dialysis waste from the definition of infectious waste. Is that right, Councilmember Vega? That's correct. Okay. Because it's in the staff report also, and it's not designated as infectious waste. At this moment, I'm not off the top of my head thinking of anything else that can be added, but we could ask wastewater staff if they have an opinion or recommendation. Mr. Wilkie? So there are two directions that are in the staff recommendation. Uh, one is to deny the appeal and one is to uphold the appeal, but both of them have a statement in there that effectively addresses the uh, water softener change to the code to allow a 4,000 grain of hardness removed and to address the definition of hazardous waste to exclude dialysis, dialysate waste. And that could be changed to include a change in the Lompoc Municipal Code um, definition of domestic discharge to include uh, what uh, Council Member Vega mentioned regarding um, domestic waste, um, which would include the processing of dialysate. I think they're in either um, the recommendation two, which is to deny the appeal, or in um, number three, which is uphold an appeal. Both of those include those two and the addition of the third to address this. And if those are all uh, acceptable by the water board, then there would not be a need for a permit. Okay. The city attorney need to simplify that. Any additions to Councilmember Vega's motion? I think you, I think you yeah, wanted so a, it, a small layer of openness because I think there was some other things you needed to potentially well, align. With any motion, I would ask the council to include allowing me to uh, wordsmith with the, with the ordinance to make it clear, 
clearly reflect what the council's intending to do. But I think what I understand from Mr. Wilkie is that staff recommendation number three, uh, uphold the appeal, overturn the director's decision, and then direct, that's A, and then B, direct staff to return with an ordinance to amend the code uh, to allow use of water softeners for industrial use with an efficiency rating of no less than 4,000 grains of hardness removed per pound of salt used in regeneration. Uh, is essentially Councilmember Vega's motion if we add the amendment to the domestic waste definition to exclude dialysis, I mean to include dialysis waste. However, you're uh, allowing softeners of 4,000 grains for industrial use, and if we're not calling this industrial use, then, right? We're going to allow softeners uh, that comply with the 4,000 grain requirement for industrial users and domestic users. Okay. That's how I understood Councilmember Vega's motion. Okay. And I'm being requested to call a short recess. Maybe five minutes while I can consult with the wastewater staff. Do we have support for that? Yeah. Okay. Councilmember Vega? Yes. Okay. I will give you your third, so you will take a 10 minute break.
Our 10 minute break is 
finished and we will reconvene the meeting and continue discussion on the motion on the floor and hear an update from staff. Councilmember Mosby. What'd you learn? <laughs> uh, thank you, Mayor and Councilmember Mosby. During the recess, I engaged in some negotiations or discussions with the wastewater staff and um, I have a recommendation for council. Because the ordinance has not yet been amended yet in accordance with Councilmember Vega's motion, it's gonna be difficult to make the findings in the resolution that would be required to uphold the appeal because the ordinance is unclear as to whether the uh, kidney center is a domestic or industrial discharger. So the recommendation is that instead of upholding the appeal, to stay the appeal, basically just put it on pause until we can present this amendment to the water board, see whether they approve it, and um, if they do approve it, then the kidney center presumably will be qualified as a domestic discharger and the problem will be over. If they do not approve it, then the appeal will come back to the city council. The only, um, Potential issue with this is that we have a 60-day deadline to decide the appeal under our code. So in order for the council to pause or uh, stay the appeal, uh, the applicant, the appellant, would need to agree to extend that 60-day deadline for however long is necessary to get a decision from the regional board. So I'd ask the applicant to come up and state whether he is in agreement with that stay and also, if he has any other comments to make to the council, he's free to do so. Thank you. Uh, Ian Guthrie, we believe that the board could go ahead and make the ruling tonight because the board has the power to interpret the statute, but having talked to city council, um, we're willing to, to agree to the stay to allow city council to amend the ordinance so that there's a little bit less uh, friction going forward. So we're uh, willing to go forward with the stay as long as there's no permit enforcement pending um, either the amendment or return for appeal. I'm certain that that's the intent. And then there are two other issues today that you could act on and that is to change the definition of an infectious waste to exclude uh, dialysate and that's been agreed upon and in fact is in the alternatives uh, with the staff report and also on the upgrade of the water softener to 4,000 uh, grams of hardness per pound. Thank you. That uh, infectious waste modification is already part of Councilmember Vega's motion, as I understand it. Councilmember Mosby. Do those have to be approved by the water board as well? The infectious waste modification, yes and as well as the water softener component. Yes. So they would all have to be wrapped up at the same time. <coughs> Councilmember Vega. Uh, Mr. City Attorney, where does it state that the Water Board has full authority over everything that we have and that what we're speaking of here since we have an appeal that's currently pending here and why would we have an appeal if we needed the Water Board approval for everything we're going to do tonight? We only need the water board's approval to amend our ordinance. So the appeal is really to determine whether the appellant is in compliance with our ordinance as it stands. We don't need the water board's approval to rule on the appeal. But so, if, okay. I'm but sorry. if we're going to amend our ordinance to change the rules, that requires the water board's approval first because the water board has to approve any changes to any city's wastewater ordinance. Uh, I do not, I don't have the expertise to know where that rule comes from, but uh, Mr. Wilkie may. Maybe I'd like to hear from Mr. Wilkie, maybe he can explain to find out exactly who's on this water board, who they represent, if Lompoc has a representative on this water board. The water board is made up of a statewide board, which has, uh, I don't know how many ma members on it, but it's their appointed members. Uh, I don't believe the regional board has a separate governance um, locally, but it is a component of the overall um, State Water Resources Control Board. Uh, so I don't believe there's any local city of Lompoc representative on that board. Um, I, I haven't researched to see who is on the 
the State Water Resources Control Board, but I would presume there are probably people like the State Treasurer, um, things like that, but I don't know what the component of um, the makeup of that board is. Thank you. I, I, want, I just wanted to see if there was anybody locally here on our wastewater board or your, you as a representative that are on that board as decision makers. I can tell you for sure that I'm not on any water resources board. Okay, thank you. So there's been a recommendation by staff to amend your motion to allow a stay while we go before the water region board and we're looking for you to allow that amendment for the stay so they can go to the water region board in order to make those changes. Now the stay, I'd like it to be in force if we can with a motion that says we're not gonna move forward at all until we hear back and then we'd like a recommendation what we can change since it sounds like the regional water board is above all. Okay, and, and, and hopefully you'd give us the advice that you would tell us the parts that we can change to amend the ordinance regardless of what it changes for this situation. We're gonna take all the amendments that you proposed in your motion, we're gonna take that to the water board for their approval. Uh, if they approve them, then we'll bring those amendments back to the council to be adopted. If they don't approve them, then we're gonna need to bring this appeal back to the council to decide how to resolve their appeal. Um, you know, Mr. City Attorney, uh, since we're going to the water board, um, we don't have any history of any of their decisions or anything like that uh, based on any other complaints from uh, another city, based on another dialysis at all that we know of. It's probably a no, but I was just wondering if there's any history or maybe even the dialysis people, uh, if they know in other cities they may have some history to tell us what they've gone through or they're their associates since they're in the business. I've never encountered this issue before, uh, so I, yeah. I'm not aware of any uh, history. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Allen or, or maybe the attorney maybe can tell us if they have any common knowledge or if this is something that's new also, just for us, so we can learn as we go through this. Um, I think you guys are inventing some new stuff here. Um, most, most communities, the dialysis units function, most of them have water softeners. The ones where they've had to put in exchange tanks are similar situations to yours where they discharge into a creek or a river rather than into the ocean. But it's, it's a case here of very much over-regulating something that really doesn't need over-regulating. Thank you, and I'd like to um, thank the wastewater people also. It looks like we're all trying to work together to find a common solution. Um, and so I'd like to thank you guys. Okay, it's not where we're opposite sides of the fence. I think we're all here to keep this, the kidney dialysis center in business. And it sounds like, Mr. Wilkie, your recommendation is really close to what my motion is. Uh, it's too bad we just didn't know we had to jump over the water board as a hoop. Um, you know, as far as f we're, we're kind of here, and if we take any recommendation, we still have to go through them. So it's kind of a frivolous motion tonight that we're doing except for the recommendation of my motion. Councilmember Starbuck. So what action do you need from the council on this, a nod of three? No, we need- Nothing? We need a vote on the motion. So I need to second. You need to okay, second. Okay, I'll do that. Well, I mean, I feel like I've been waterboarded all night, literally waterboarded. I mean, I'm in Gitmo right now. I'm just saying. Any more attorney talk and I'm out of here. So yeah, I'll give you a second. To the amendment, all right. So we have a motion on the floor. It's been amended and seconded. Any other questions or concerns before we vote? Seeing none, let's vote. And that passes four zero with one abstention. All right. Any written communications? Nothing. Thank you. Oral communications regarding city matters Podium is open for two minutes max. Seeing no one rise, we close oral communications and we'll start with council comments meeting reports. Council Member Mosby. Good night and thanks for listening to us. A lot of patience, John.
I just wanted to follow up with the meeting with the uh, at the uh, Surf Beach, the Coastal Commission, and <clears throat> two two items I think that the city can work on at this time. One was uh, writing the state fish and wildlife um, to ask um, the avenue and the movement forward to bring back fishing at Surf Beach, at least for the barred sand perch and stuff. So. Uh, that instead of the preserve component, they could have certain, another component would allow us to do that. Um, there was a mechanism that was presented, and I, I don't know if you got a follow-up email with the city manager on that. They, there were people saying they're willing to assist to help with that, but I'd like to push forward with that, at least getting a letter going to the, um, the commissioners of, the, of Fish and, uh, California Fish and Wildlife. Uh, so I guess I'd need two other people to go along with that or to, to bring it back. I was going to say, yeah, if you want to get the three, but I'll do it. Um, we just haven't had a chance at the moment, but now we're back people from vacation okay. and whatnot. So yeah, that was a key piece. That was on the, Van, what's that called? Vandenberg Marine Preserve. So we just have to write yeah. to the state. It's not the, the, the Monterey base. Marine Preserve I'd, area. I'd like to yep. push on that by, by the... Council Member Mosby, do you want the letter to come back to council for approval before it's sent? Yeah, I think it'd be good to, for, for us all to see it. Yeah, before it's sent. So that requires three votes. Two other, two other peeps. I'll give you a second. Third. Okay. the other, The other potential opportunity out there that we discovered was that the uh, uh, to reopen the lagoon out there, uh, we found out that the county, or at least it was discussed then that the county was. So maybe a letter writing to the county, as well to the county board of supervisors, to um, entertain the opportunity to reopen the lagoon as we found out that the base has the lagoon upper part open they have boats out there and and hunting and duck hunting and such i know that they used to water ski in that lagoon and uh, other opportunities maybe it could be canoeing and kayaking there was talk about doing it at kachuma lake uh be nice to have a little water sport activity back here for our peeps so it's two other people with a letter to come back to us as well yep. yeah i'll second that also i actually uh, skied in that lagoon as a kid so was fun. Yep. No, we can write that too. The, that discussion that day was someplace to even launch. They could put in a launching area. Well, there was a concrete launch there. I was, yeah. didn't get pictures yet, but the, the, it's under the dirt. It's still under there. Under the dirt, okay. It's still there. Clean it off. We could dig it out. If you need a third, I'll, I'll third. Okay. Uh, the other thing that was brought to my attention by uh, um, one of the police chief's officers is some of the complexities that are happening with the uh, free needle giveaway and maybe the city attorney can come back with us with a staff report maybe make motion on uh, or to make a motion on something on how to regulate um the free giveaway that's going on uh, i've seen it where it's they, they actually take up sidewalks and they're passing out tourniquets and other stuff right on the sidewalks and watch kids having to walk around the tables as they're passing out these needles so um maybe we can look at it i know we've had some comp complications with some city staff. Uh, I know we had a heck of a complication in the bottom of the riverbed uh, with thousands and thousands and thousands of these there. So maybe we can look at something there to um, the best way to regulate that. So the two others to. Okay. So there's nodding. So yeah, we, I'll get with the city attorney on that one. Okay. Yes, you need a third. A third. And I didn't attend any meetings, went to a number of events, but not at city expense. Councilmember Starbuck. No reports. Councilmember Vega. No reports. Thank you. I attended the chamber annual dinner and issued the proclamations and certificates. Uh, so the Carpa Hall Vets Breakfast with the certificates there. I went to the Youth Football League Open Ceremonies and the Lomhoek Hospital Women's Auxiliary 75th Anniversary. I had the honor of meeting the Undersecretary for the Air Force, John Roth, at a private Vandenberg event and representing our community. I'm proud to say, despite all the other mayors in the area being invited, I was the only one who actually showed up, so it was very nice to have the Undersecretary to myself for nearly an hour and uh, hope that he takes away the um, need for the uh, Space Command to be based at Vandenberg. 
Then I also had the pleasure of meeting Roger DeHart, who was walking through our community from San Francisco all the way to San Diego to bring awareness to human trafficking. And the Lompoc Police Department and the North County Rape Crisis Center also uh, took a moment to meet with him. It turned out to be his rest day, so he spent the day in Lompoc, both uh, going out to the base and getting a tour and walking around town and relaxing and going to our football game, and despite us losing, uh, was very impressed with it and then hit the road again on Saturday morning. So we appreciate Roger bringing attention to that issue. And again, as the city manager mentioned, um, the World War I Memorial, the Eagle has been placed on top and there will be a celebration this Saturday at Stone Pine at 11 a.m. I do have a council request. Given all of the issues and appeals that we are getting regard our, regarding our wastewater ordinances, I would like uh, to request that staff be instructed to hire a qualified consultant to evaluate our ordinances and in accordance with our updated MPDES and SSMPS alphabet soup of all of those regulations, since we are simply an enforcement agency for the water region and the EPA, that we need to do a thorough assessment and a thorough modernization, and I think having an independent consultant might be ideal, so that would be my request. Just to be clear, this is not a request to hire a consultant, but it's to bring back an agenda item to discuss hiring a consultant. Yes, there are a lot of issues going on, and I think we need to be proactive about addressing them rather than to continue having multiple appeals. Councilmember Mosby. Isn't the SSMP plan coming back before council? Yes, it is. So at that time, do we, do we have staff or consultants that are working with that? I'm gonna refer that question to wastewater staff. The last update was done internally by the wastewater superintendent, and I believe um, that's one thing that Dave is looking to do this time around. Um, he's not the same superintendent that was here in 2014, but um, he's looking to do it uh, internally rather than having a hired consultant to, um, pr provide input. In, and I think in, in light of what we're having right now, the, the, um, we were, we'd asked that before to be aligned with our ordinances, be aligned with what we're doing that, and that needs to come back to us in time. Do you know the, the date of that, Mr. Wilkie? Uh, no, I don't. But it would, be, it would make sense to do this process altogether. And no. Exactly. That's why I want to make sure that we're coordinating and balanced. Do, do we need a consultant to the, do this? Do you mean the SSMP or the ordinance update and permit review? Yes. Um, the whole package. I would think it would be a good idea to have an outside independent person take a look at our um, overall scope of the wastewater pretreatment program, yeah. If I may. The uh, this is, um, lost my train of thought. Um, this is the kind of discussion that we should have at the agenda item that council, that Mayor Osborne is requesting, uh, to discuss whether the city needs to hire a consultant. Uh, so if the council wants to give her two other votes to have that discussion, then we can bring that agenda item back. My, my only question was when it was it lining naturally with staff already or whether we need to expedite this because we might need a time constraint on this. Well, backing up a step, the wastewater division, uh, I think it was last year, maybe the year before, ha had already contracted with a consultant to do exactly this. So that person's been on board, I think, since probably late 2017, early 2018 to do this. So that that scope is only for the pre-treatment program and the code update, but I would think it would be something we could uh, amend to uh, address the SSMP as well. That's not typically something that's um, part of the pre-treatment program, it's separate, but it could be certainly uh, folded into the process that's ongoing with our existing And, and I guess uh, what I'm getting at is, without cutting you off, that t I think time is of the essence here as well. I believe on this, so maybe could expedite this. I th yeah, we've already discussed moving the process to get the um, 
modification for the code update to come to um, a point where it can be discussed. Okay. Right now it's just a bunch, uh, it's, there are several different paths that are going on with it right now, that, but I've asked to have it consolidated into one compre comprehensive um, revision. So. And, if, and if the mayor would add some uh, language that have this to be expedited so that we don't, I believe it, the last time it was such a short notice, it was very difficult to go through it all. But I think we need to uh, push further, faster, further on this. So I would give you a second if you would. Bring, bring back a staff report quickly, you're saying. Yes. I believe that was understood, but if you need the additional verbiage of the sooner the better, I can agree to that. I'll say, I'll give you a third. Is, is it gonna be on the future council agenda items? We can add it. We can add it, yes. Thank you for that. Um, we will now adjourn the Lompoc City Council meeting. Oh, Council Member Vega, sorry. That got a long winded. He, he already said he had no reports. Okay, we'll try this again. We'll adjourn the Lompoc City Council until 6.30 p.m. on September 17th, 2019.